Okay, welcome to this uh, lecture uh, about land cover change detection using remote sensing. Um, this lecture is separated into three different parts. First, we're going to talk about different techniques that is used for detecting changes uh, of the land cover. Secondly, what the requirements there are of uh, the data that you are using for uh, um, finding a change in the land cover. And then finally, what the other environmental conditions can, that can influence your um, analysis that you need to take care of. So why is this so important then? Um, the Earth's surface is dynamic. It is under constant change. It's not like the vegetation is static and uh, villages are constantly like it is. It is a dynamic place. And in order to study these dynamics, we need to uh, understand the changes that is going on on the land surface. And today, humans affect 80% of the Earth's surface. So we have a major influence of what's going on on the Earth. And this, of course, has big impacts on, um, on the nature, on the biodiversity. And uh, it's actually, since the Industrial Revolution, it's the second largest uh, source of carbon to the atmosphere, um, with about 30% of the total emissions of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, after the fossil fuel use, use of fossil fuel, then, of course. Okay. And the most commonly used techniques for uh, detecting change uh, of the land surface using remote sensing are um, these ones. And I will go through them one by one. Um, and it's then um, we start with image algebra then uh, image regression, then about uh, principal component analysis, about uh, change vector analysis, and uh, post-classification change detections. So first then, image algebra change detection. So we have two different images, one at time one, uh, the one to the left, and then one at time two, which is the one to the right at the upper corner. Uh, we make a comparison between the two by simply taking the difference between the two. Um, and this will give us a map of how much the, um, um, the values of the satellite image has changed between these points in time. Uh, then we can set a certain threshold and decide that, okay, above this threshold, we say that it has been a change in the land cover. Um, and this is a very simple technique to study changes of the land surface. Um, but of course, it's then necessary to set a good threshold to make sure that you have actually seen a, an actual change and that it's not caused by something different. So, we are going to um, look at an example where uh, this specific technique has been used. And uh, what you see here is two NDVI images. I assume that you know what NDVI is by now. Um, but it's a measure of uh, uh, vegetation greenness, one can say. Um, and these two images are taken in uh, two different points in time, one in 1980 and the other in 1990, and uh, at similar time of the year, but then of course at different years. And we will see what have happened uh, with the vegetation over this, uh, uh, this uh, decennium using these, uh, this technique. So what we simply do is that we take the difference in the vegetation, the NDVI, from the 1990 image and subtract it from the veg uh, NDVI of the 1980 image. And uh, the result can be seen here that there are uh, some areas with a larger change and um, some areas with less change, the yellow parts have less change then. And uh, here on the right side, we can see an, uh, an histogram of the differences. And you can see that on average, 
the differences are slightly negative, which means that NDVI was a little bit higher on average in 1990 than in 1980, since we uh, subtract the 1990 from the 1980, so negative values mean slightly higher in 1990. Um, but uh, this could just be caused by uh, maybe the images were taken at uh, slightly different dates or uh, maybe the vegetation was uh, generally greener, it was uh, better growing conditions in 1990 than 1980. Um, so we should not focus on this average part, but the areas that have the largest changes, they are the ones that is out to in the furthest out in the histogram. Um, so what we simply do is that we set the threshold where everything that has changed more or less than two standard deviations is considered areas uh, with a significant change. And uh, this is shown on this image here. So we can see that some parts of the images here have had a significant positive change. There is uh, more greenness, more vegetation in these uh, blue dots here, whereas uh, some parts have a significant negative change, which is this part which is um, uh, red here in this image here. And the second technique we are going to talk about is called image regression. And uh, what we simply do using this technique is that if we have one image from uh, time one, like in the uh, last example from uh, 1980, and then the uh, second image from uh, the last example 1990, uh, we can assume that there is a very close relationship between the pixels in these two images if there have been no change. So say the values with low NDVI in 1980 they should also have very low values in 1990, uh, whereas the images with high NDVI in 1980 should also have very high values in 1990. So what we simply do is to take, uh, uh, we make a linear regression between these two and then take the residuals from this regression to the different pixels. And if the residuals then are, um, very high, like these uh, dots up here. They deviate a lot from this relationship. We can assume that there has been a major change. Uh, these dots here, for example, you can see they have a high NDVI in 1990, whereas there were low values in 1980. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this means that uh, there has been a considerable greenness, maybe there has been a, a cropland conversion or something like that. Um, so we just do take this um, relationship and um, calculate the residuals and then everything above a certain threshold uh, will be considered uh, pixels where there is a land cover change. And the third technique we're going through uh, for detecting land uh, cover change is the principal component analysis. Um, and what we then do is that we start with plotting the values from the image in time one, say 1980, against time two, 1990. And what we start with is to find the axis that explains most of the variance in the data. Um, just like a linear regression here, you can see that the component that change that explains the largest variability here um, will be the component that uh, indicates where there have been no change at all. Just like if we set the linear regression here, uh, there is no change in the data. There is uh, low NDVI values here, high NDVI values there in both uh, images. And it's the same thing here with the uh, first principal component. High NDVI values in time one, high NDVI values in time two. 
and low values in time one and low values in time two. Um, so the first principal component will indicate no changes at all. Whereas um, the second principal component is then what, what we do is that we first take the first principal component and then uh, remove it from the data and then find the, um, uh, the direction orthogonality orthogonal to the first principal component that explains the largest variance in the data again. And that is the second principal component. And just like here, that the, uh, the higher the residual from the linear regression, the uh, larger the changes has been, and the lower the residuals, the uh, lower the changes have been. Um, same thing here, just like if the second principal component has a very high value, it indicates or a very negative value, it will indicate a large change. Uh, it's far from the first principal component, which indicates no change. Whereas if the values in the second principal component is, is low, close to zero, it's close to the first principal component and indicate no change at all. So the, the second principal component will indicate the large, uh, large areas with change. Um, and the good thing with the principal component analysis is that it's this orthogonality indicates that what's going on on this axis is completely independent to what's going on on this axis here um, in the first principal component. And, um, and this is very good in time series analysis where we often have problem with uh, autocorrelated data that what's going on in one year is often closely correlated to what's going on the year after. And uh, by doing this, we remove this autocorrelation and the second component completely shows what's going on. What is the actual change? Okay, here is an example of a principal component analysis doing a change detection around the area of Lake Mead in Nevada. And the data is obtained in 2000 and 2003. So uh, that's the dates between the, the years between uh, which the analysis has been done. And here you can see the first principal component, which basically then indicates that, okay, here we have low values, which is then uh, where there is a lake because the lake absorbs a lot of the incoming radiation um, generating low values, whereas the land, uh, more of the, the incoming radiation is reflected back to space, so values are higher here than there. Uh, but then um, the second principal component is then how much each pixel deviates from this first principal component. So this is the one that actually indicates how much the values has been changed uh, between these points in time. And you can see here that uh, along the coastline of the lake, there has been large, large changes going on, um, which is the sign of um, uh, changes in the water level. So uh, the water level have dropped uh, a lot between uh, 2000 and 2003 in this area. Um, and that's what we can see here. And then the uh, the lower principal components is uh, how much each pixel deviates from both these components. So uh, this can also indicate some changes and uh, maybe there has been some um, uh, vegetation changes in these regions here. Um, but since this is the deviation from both the second component and the first component, it's, uh, it's minor compared to the second component that indicates the largest change going on in the area. Um, and you can see that the further down we get, the noisier the data and the, um, basically in the, in the final, uh, uh, in the fifth and the sixth component, we only see uh, salt and pepper, which is basically just noise. Then. So, uh, so when doing a land change detection with PCA, you should, uh, focus on especially the second component 
and perhaps use some information in the further as well. The next change detection technique we're going through is the change vector analysis. Um, what we do in this um, technique is that we plot, we take a pixel from uh, point one in time. Again, we can say that this is 1980 and this is 1990. Um, and we take the near infrared reflectance from 1980 and the red reflectance from 1980 and plot it against each other and we get the dot there. For the same pixel in 1990, we take again the red and the near infrared and uh, get the dot up there. Um, and if there has been a large change here, then that of course would indicate that, okay, there is something going on in this, uh, in this pixel. Um, so we can use this information for uh, detecting changes in, um, in an area. Um, but first, say, um, maybe one year there is uh, better growing conditions, um, the sun is shining more and the rain has been perfect and the, uh, yeah, you know, temperature is nicer. So uh, growing conditions are really good. So, but still it's the same type of vegetation. Um, but there have been some changes going on. So first we need to set the threshold that, okay, all values that are within this region, they are still considered to be um, uh, no change detection. Whereas if the values have grown to become outside of this threshold, uh, we consider that there has been a change. For example, if we clear all the forest and uh, uh, there will be less uh, red reflectance absorbed by the uh, growing by the vegetation and uh, uh, and uh, values would get outside here for example and then uh, we can say okay here is uh, is uh, places where there have been changes going on here there has been a, a clearing of the forest and whereas here is it um, more of the reflectance it is absorbed and thereby it's uh, it's been a regrowth of the vegetation. And in this analysis, we get two different images um, uh, out of the analysis. We get one that is the length of the change, which is the magnitude, um, which is that image there, and then uh, one which is the angle of change, which is the direction then of the, uh, of the vector. So uh, if there has been a positive change, the values will be positive, whereas if the values has been going down instead, the uh, change direction will be negative. Um, and both of these things can be used to detect uh, uh, changes in an area. The final technique we're going through is the post-classification change detection technique. Um, and what it actually does is simply we're doing a land cover classification of the image from time one, from if we continue with our example from 1980, and then we do a land cover classification from time two, 1990. Um, we do the classification. You will, you will learn more about land cover classification in, during the Lumix Kundun exercise that you will do uh, a little bit later in the course. Um, yeah, so we get the classified image from 1980 and we get the classified image from 1990 and then we can see if there has been any changes in the land cover classes between these two by doing a cross tabulation. Um, for example, you can see here that um, maybe this red thing here is a road, so we can see that between 1980 and 1990 there has been a road built here in this area. Um, so this will pop out here in this cross tabulation as a vegetation to change to road uh, value here. Um, and the most important thing here is the accuracy of the input maps that is used for this land cover classification. Um, say that you use a land cover that you have obtained in 1990 and then apply that on the land, on the satellite image from 1980, 
you can get the completely wrong data. So it's really important that, that the input data used for parameterization of the classification in 1980 is from the same point in time as the image was taken and uh, the same thing for the uh, uh, land cover classification for the point uh, two in time from 1990 then. So um, yeah, that's, that's difficult with this thing, but uh, yes. Uh, and here we have an example of uh, such an um, analysis. Uh, you can see here that uh, we have some different land cover classes here in uh, 1971 from uh, Westboro and we have some land cover classes from 1991 from Westboro and um, yeah you can see that here there have been some uh, roads built in 1990 there have uh, a lot of forests here has been converted into um, industrial or commercial areas um, yeah, so you can see these different things that have happening in the area by doing this uh, a comparison between these two different uh, land cover images. Um, yes, that was it for the first part of this lecture. So now we'll take a short coffee break. You may take as long as you want, of course, and then uh, continue watch the next video. Thank you very much.